Hello people, let us look at ophthalmology history taking. Basically, we will only look at the pro forma in this. So, uh, just like any other history taking, you will first take the bio data, name of the person, age of the person. What else will you ask? Uh, address, occupation, education, socioeconomic status, everything you can do here, right? Informant, if the person is informing themselves or not, if it is important, you can write. As you know, age, uh, why is it important, guys? There can be congenital cataract or senile cataract. Usually, you will get senile cataract. Then, see, guys, cataract can be congenital, developmental, right? Um, uh, Pre-senile, that is before 45 or 50, you can say. Senile cataract after 45, 50, like that, you can say. So, you should know why you should, uh, that is important. Coming to presenting complaints now, guys. What are we moving to? We are moving to presenting complaints. Focus. So, presenting complaints means what will you say? It's the chief complaint, right? What is the person complaining about? Like example in cataract, what will they complain about? It will be a diminution of vision, which I you should say, whether it is right eye or left eye or both. So, basically, um, here, here guys, two things can give away for you. Is it sudden? Is it painless? So, in cataract, usually it will be gradual and painless, right? So, that will give you an uh, information if that you are adding here. However, anyways, in history of presenting illness, you have to elaborate right so he will say the patient was apparently normal so many months back when she noticed um, diminution of vision insidious and onset gradually progressive in nature right then you will come to details whether it is for near vision or distant vision right whether it is during day or night here you have to tell how much they were able to see before and how much they are able to see now right uh, let's say distant vision how much were they able to see before you need to know before all this happened this eight months uh, when uh, the, your, the patient is presenting before that so, nine months back, one year back, were they able to see? How much were they able to see? Right? All that you have to find out. Then um, you will find out whether it is this diminution of vision is more during day or night. Okay? So, you need to find out whether the diminution of vision is during day or night. Because if it is a uh, day, then it will be nuclear cataract, isn't it? Anything central will be day blindness. So, it's only day means it will usually be nuclear. Right? And uh, if it is a uh, night, it will be cortical, isn't it? And if it is both, usually you can say it is posterior, subcapsular uh, or polar cataract, isn't it? Guys, then you will check whether there is glare. Glare, where and all can you see guys? It's an early symptom of cataract. <clears throat> Remember, it's one of the earliest signs of cataract. And even in corneal edema and in post-refractive surgeries like LASIK and all, there can be glare, okay? So, cataract usually will be painless. So, you'll ask for pain, then a redness. You'll ask for redness history, watering. Watering of the eye, discharge, any bro ache or headache. All this you will ask, okay? So, are you getting it, guys? So, what and all will you ask? We are actually looking at a case a pro forma. Actually, we are trying to look for a cataract kind of a thing, okay? So, look at this. If the person has day blindness, he can either have a central nuclear or a polar cataract. He can have a cupuliform cataract. It starts at the center of the cortex, right? Um, then, when it comes to glare, what did you see? Glare is going to be the earliest symptom of cataract. Why does glare happen? It is because of diffraction of light by lenticular opacity. Okay, so it will be uh, there will be diffraction of light by lenticular opacity. So the lens is getting opacified, right? Are you getting it? The lens is getting opacified. So there is diffraction of light. So he will have glare. Okay, then these people can have polyopia also. They can see multiple, right? Multiple images they can see. Then they can also have colored halo as an earlier symptom. Earlier symptom can be colored halo, uniocular, polyopia, glare, etc. Okay. If these people are saying that they are seeing better than before, right, for near vision, then what will you understand? It's a nuclear cataract because nuclear uh, nucleus has become sclerosed. So it is able to see better, right? Because of what? The index change of the uh, in of the lens, especially the nuclear part. So you understand that. So, basically, if it is nuclear cataract, what will they tell you guys? If it is nuclear cataract, they will tell you they are not able to see far. Far is reducing with time, but the near thing has improved. Guys, if there is pain, redness, watering, discharge and all, no, then it can mean that there is something also, uh, along with the cataract. If you are saying it is cataract, then along with it, there is some other condition which is giving you all this, okay? Okay, let's move on to the ocular history now, guys. Um, ocular history, basically, you will uh, find out whether this person was wearing specs before in life, right? Let's write that down. Whether this person was wearing spectacles before in life or contacts or whatever. For what was he wearing it? For how long? Near vision, distant vision or both? Does he know what his power is, etc. Okay. Then, does he give you a history of uh, surgery? Of what? Ocular surgery, right? Any medication are they taking in the eye? So, all this you will ask here. 
trauma any history of trauma because you know traumatic cataract is what is that rosette rosette cataract isn't it then here eye drops eye drops uh, long duration or short duration you have to ask the duration also and what exactly is it if they know and um, to right eye or left eye or both the eyes all that you can ask here so basically everything that has happened to the eye for all these years so guys let us say they have taken steroids then what would have happened if that person has taken steroids he would have landed up with a posterior subcapsular cataract okay if he has taken some meiotics long term meiotics like uh, some uh, drugs which anyways this is rare they are saying this could be lead to anterior sub subcapsular cataract then if these people have had trauma then they will have what rosette cataract or conclusion cataract they are saying voschius ring you can see because of the trauma isn't it the pupillary margin would have got uh, left a mark on the anterior capsule isn't it then let's move on to past history guys what do you say let's shall we move on to past history so here you want to know whether these people have some diabetic history right or hypertensive or uh, copd copd asthma ischemic heart disease you want to know all this and also tuberculosis okay what and all you will ask here in past history you will ask about diabetes so diabetic retinopathy hypertensive di uh, retinopathy and if they are uh, having uh, ischemic heart disease tuberculosis right so basically what will happen if there is uh, diabetes see these people will have early onset of this cataract they'll ha uh, but if it is a true diabetic cataract they'll have the snowflake right and uh, they'll have a snow storm cataract you can see. they can ask you why this happens because of the all the sorbitol accumulation in the lens isn't it standard things about diabetes right they will they are more prone to infections and you know the complications of uh, diabetic retinopathy vitreous hemorrhage then uh, retinal detachment which type of retinal detachment tractional and they can go into uh, neovascular glaucoma so diabetic retinopathy so delayed healing also these people will have hypertensive retinopathy again you have these grades right so what do you see here salu sign bonnet sign gun sign copper wiring silver wiring remember all these come specially in your hypertensive retinopathy asthma means you should not give them uh, beta blockers so that's why you should know about it then what about this ischemic heart disease and tuberculosis because in asthma actually timolol is contraindicated betoxolol you can give because betoxolol selectively blocks beta 1 receptors okay so it can be used safely in patients with asthma copd etc however um in card the cardiac side effects are more with betoxolol so you need to know whether the person have is having any cardiac issues okay then when it comes to copd you need to know because the uh, if there is coughing it can lead to iris prolapse then coming to ihd guys um, aspirin uh, why should you know his uh, ihd history because aspirin has to be stopped before surgery and in case why should you know he is a tuberculosis patient because you will have to know uh, you'll have to check for dacryosuscitis and tuberculosis has so many other problems isn't it guys what is the next uh, heading the next heading is family history guys let's look at the family now father mother brother sister do they have any history of cataract uh, uh, or cataract surgery because some they saying the maturity onset or uh, the onset duration the age at onset and the maturation etc will depend on family history i think it has more importance in glaucoma what do you say guys then coming to personal history you ask him about his diet appetite habits right what will you ask here guys in uh, personal history can habits and all this uh, also show hygiene to you right if they are very hygienic or not you can know isn't it then socio economic history you will know to know the uh, you can say uh, the, the background the cause whether they exposed to uv rays all the time sunlight dry dusty environment or such things and also to know if they can afford the surgery because which type of surgery they would be able to afford isn't it then we are moving on to general physical examination guys we have looked at uh, in the history we have looked at the pa uh, first part now let us look at general physical examination so what and all you can know here guys temperature pulse uh, respiratory rate and blood pressure so i think you will do this isn't it don't forget general physical examination then we'll go to ocular examination okay now focus guys we have moved to specific ocular examination head posture is it erect straight posture without any tilt all that you should say then is there any torticollis uh, right what will be the cause for head tilt they will ask you if there is any problem with the oblique muscles right if the face has turned itself to one side then what will you say because of medial rectus or lateral rectus so they are trying to compensate for that then if their chin is elevated that means they are looking up kind of a thing that means they have ptosis 
Okay, what else? They have overaction of the depressors, probably paralysis of elevators. If there is depression of chin, that means they are kind of looking down, then what will be there? The overaction of the elevators, underaction of the depressors, paralysis of depressors. So basically, you can say the eyeball is not going down, so face itself, they are trying to put it down, right? So uh, the depressors of the eyeball are not working, so depression of chin they are doing, okay? Then coming to facial symmetry, guys, how is the face? Both sides, left, right and left. Here, the this is where, where you are shaking, right, left, face symmetry, face right entire face so both sides of the face are the symmetrical or not are the eyebrows eyelids at same level nasolabial folds angle of mouth all this so if it is not symmetrical then what could the causes be facial nerve palsy unil, um, unilateral ptosis right so one eye is drooping probably one eyelid then if there is abnormal facial symmetry then what what will you do you'll have to examine the patient for third nerve pal then you will do here ocular posture ocular posture ocular posture means what you will check the visual axis right if they are parallel then good otherwise they can have you will check whether their person has esotropia exotropia hypertropia all that squint strabismus you would have learned right all that you will do now let's move on guys um, ocular examination further detail right left you will separate now and uh, you're going to check uh, visual acuity okay visual acuity is the ability to distinguish the shape of the object this is a retinal function okay so you can check near uh, vision and distant vision so distant vision means you can check what whether they are counting the fingers uh, at uh, greater than 6 meter whether counting fingers at 6 meter without any tool you can use isn't it then uh, a hand movement if they, they are not able to count hand movement perception of light perception of rays also pro sorry projection of rays i thought yeah projection of rays all that you will check okay if you want some assistance then you can go with the visual acuity charts like snellen's chart right you can check snellen's chart what are we checking distant vision you can check snellen's chart how will you do snellen's uh, if they ask you you'll ask them to sit at six uh, meter distance and ask them to read you'll uh, close one eye with the palm isn't it so basically guys they'll ask you basic questions is why is it at six meters the snellen's chart so you will say that at 6 meters, uh, from 6 meter whatever rays comes to your eye, right, that will come almost parallel. So, that's why they are using it. So, you will not put too much accommodation to see it. So, do you know any chart other than Snellen's chart? Yes, there is Landolt's uh, C chart, Allen's picture chart, etc. Picture chart you can remember, okay. Then near vision, how will you check? Distant over, now near. Now, you know Jigger's chart is there. Yeah, you are already smart, right. So, you have Jigger's chart, Roman near vision chart, Snellen's also near vision chart is also there, okay. Then you can check color vision. Then you can check visual field. Visual field and all you have done in your physiology, isn't it? Perimetry, confrontation test. What else will you do here? Let's move to the next one, guys. Eyebrows. So you will say whether these are symmetrically placed, whether they are curved with convexity upward, whether the hair are in comma shaped, whether the... So many things are there. Abnormalities of eyebrows, if they ask, you just say that uh, they can be raised on the side of ptosis, okay? Then if there is some problem with eyebrow, it could be in leprosy, syphilis, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, trauma, infection, scars, okay. So if it is, uh, if there is graying of eyebrows, what is it called as? Poliosis, very good. Unilateral vitiligo, you can have that Vogt Koyanagi Harada syndrome, all those will be there. So uh, you understood eyebrows. Then move, let's move to eyelids. Guys, uh, are we going too much in detail? Look at eyelids now. So you will, uh, what and all you have to describe about the eyelids. Eyelids, you will have to talk about the See, these are the eyelids. So, we are talking about the upper one. Yeah, position of the eyelids, margins of the eyelids. Yes, movement, the palpebral aperture width, you will have to say, then skin over the eyelids. Okay, so normal position, uh, the upper eyelid will have to cover one sixth of the cornea, and lower eyelid will just touch the limbus, lower limbus. So, that's how it looks in this. Very good. Then, what can you talk about the margins of eyelids, guys? So, we can talk about ectropion, entropion, then uh, thickened eye eyelid margin can be tylosis, epicanthus, telecanthus, increased distance between the two medial canthi, right? Then, um, what else can you tell? Blepharitis, movements, movements of eyelids, increased blinking, decreased blinking, how you feel, they are blinking too much or what? Then, 
palpebral aperture width guys you can say whether it is horizontally narrow or vertically narrow or vertically wide etc you can say all that horizontally it's anyways wide isn't it very good the, guys here they have not mentioned eyelashes guys you have to mention eyelash eyelash what will you see again poliosis and then uh, trichiasis isn't it trichiasis uh, you know then a uh, distichiasis where there are two rays right of uh, eyelashes madrosis with decreased number of cilia of eyelashes or even the eyebrows then you have poliosis presence of uh, local hypopigmented hair follicles right so this they didn't say then skin over the eyelid how is it see in any condition the skin over the eyelid it's very easy for it to swell you know because it's the thinnest skin uh, in the body it says it doesn't have subcutaneous fatty tissue right and guys the submuscular areolar tissue of the upper eyelid is in continuity with the sub aponeurotic space of scalp okay so there is easy passage of fluid and blood leading to black eye ecchymosis you know when there is head injury you will have um, uh, ecchymosis of upper eyelid you know that so all that is because of that okay we are done with uh, eyelids now let's move on to lacrimal apparatus guys don't forget lacrimal apparatus okay it's, it's, i think it's very easy to forget lacrimal apparatus because uh, you, when you go in order right you uh, just go from outside to inside and you forget um, a lacrimal apparatus look at lacrimal apparatus basically what and all you will check here the puncta okay lower puncta you can see uh, upper puncta you'll have to avert the upper eyelid a little they said then uh, skin over the lacrimal sac area you will check then uh, regurgitation test that is roplas right roplas actually you can do in examination not in uh, when you are visually inspecting i think you should not do isn't it what do you say where would you put this roplas okay so basically regurgitation test this is you'll apply pressure over the lacrimal sac area with thumb or with index finger and look for regurgitation uh, of any you know thing from the upper or lower punctum okay normally it will be negative so you can have that it is um, if it gives discharge then it could be a chronic dacryocystitis basically if there is a mucosal and chronic dacryocystitis you will not get any discharge but then you should know this is a false negative isn't it or you can see that these puncta are everted right there could be stenosis of a punctum so those are some abnormalities you should know about lacrimal uh, apparatus now we'll move to the eyeball guys let's move to the eyeball so here we are let's move to the eyeball so eyeball guys uh, so eyeball here so the eyeball as such the position of the eyeball the size of the eyeball the movements of the eyeball you need ocular movements binocular movements okay all this you will check see the eyeball could be proptosed right uh, why can it be proptosed uh, proptosed you should know all those causes right is it unilateral proptosis is there some uh, dermoid cyst or orbital teratoma is there some inflammation like orbital cellulitis right then uh, what else guys so why will there be proptosis guys so many things are there so you will have to write all that then bilateral proptosis they can have again in cavernous sinus thrombosis in uh, what else can you say exophthalmos that is because of thyroid eye disease right then coming to pulsating uh, proptosis where will you see guys yes in carotid cavernous fistula true pulsating proptosis aneurysm of the internal carotid artery just remember all these guys eyeball proptosis true pulsation uh, it can happen in carotid cavernous fistula aneurysm of internal carotid artery okay then coming to size of the eyeball guys how much should it be anterior posteriorly it should be around uh, 24 mm or millimeter all that you can learn why will the eyeball size increase guys why will the eyeball size increase it can increase because of high myopia bupthalmos why will the eyeball size decrease because of microphthalmos or sthesis bulbi atrophic bulbi all that you know then coming to movements movements of eyeball right we are talking about movements of eyeball in that we are talking about unilocular uniocular movements and binocular movements uniocular movements means it will be duction okay binocular movements will be versions and vergens so if there's some problem then it uh, it can be because of third nerve paresis right fourth nerve so many things you know which muscle is supplied by which nerve isn't it guys now let's move on to conjunctiva guys let's move to conjunctiva so conjunctiva 
So basically here uh, you have so many types of conjunctiva. You have the palpable conjunctiva, valvular conjunctiva, conjunctival fornesses, superior forness and inferior forness both you have. So uh, basically how will you examine conjunctiva? Valvular conjunctiva anyways you can um, you know retract the eyelid and you can check. For the upper palpebral you will have to avert the upper eyelid. And superior fornix though is even very very difficult. They'll have to double avert using Desmar's lid retractor. Okay, I think you won't be expected to do that, but you will have to know how to check. When it comes to abnormality of conjunctiva, what and all can be there, right? Congestion can be there. Chemosis, chemosis means edema, right? There, that can be there. Then there can be discoloration if there is some ecchymosis. Then it can go from red to orange to yellow or something, isn't it? Then there can be follicles. Follicles where will you see in trachoma? Papillae where will you see in vernal keratoconjunctivitis? conjunctivitis? Then you can have a pterygium or a or a pingicula, or there can be some cyst or tumor, or there can be xerosis. That is. In uh, vitamin A deficiency, you know, you've seen xerosis of conjunctiva or there can be exposure keratopathy, right? That time also there can be xerosis of conjunctiva. What do you say, people? Dry, dry conjunctiva, xerosis. Then you can see bite out spots, right? Very good. Then what else can you see? Now let's go to cornea, guys. Cornea, where is our cornea here? So uh, you will check, first of all, as soon as you see, you will see the size of the cornea. You will see the shape of the cornea. You will see the surface, the sheen, the sensations and the transparency. Sensation, I think you'll have to do some test. Otherwise, by inspection, whatever possible, you're writing here, right? Then uh, size means it can be very small. When small, who, whom can it be small, guys? Myopia, it can be small or what? Because these people will have anyway small eye. Then uh, there can be macrocornea, megalocornea. You can see that in Bufthalmos, right? Where else can you see? Okay, then in uh, glaucoma also they are seeing infantile glaucoma. That only is Bufthalmos, right? Keratoglobus. Then coming to shape, guys. The curvature. What abnormalities can you see in the curvature? Keratoconus, keratoglobus. Then, how will you measure the corne uh, corneal curvature, guys? Keratometry. Very good. Then, um, what else? Surface of the cornea. Smooth. Is it smooth, etc.? You can see. Then, how will you check that? Placebo's disc, isn't it? Placebo's disc, guys. Are you fine? Are, what are we looking at? We are looking at cornea. We are looking at its uh, uh, properties. Sheen, guys, you want it to be very uh, uh, shiny, right? So, if it's not shining, then why is it? Dry eye, yes. Corneal opacity, very good. Sensations. Sensations of the cornea, guys. Diminished sensation. It's actually very sensitive. If there is diminished uh, sensation, it can be because of paralysis of the trigeminal nerve or familial, some problem these people have, damage to the sensory nerve ending, systemic diseases like diabetes mellitus, leprosy also, they'll have decreased sensation. Okay. They could have taken long term eye drops like thymolol, betoxolol, ketorolac, etc. They would have decreased the sensation. Coming to transparency, guys. So, transparency, we are seeing uh, it should be transparent. You should be able to see. The structures inside, isn't it? Very clearly, you should be able to see. Why is the cornea transparent? It's avascular. It has a specific arrangement, isn't it? Lattice theory of Maury's. Uh, then uh, you know the epithelium, how it works, and the endothelium tries to push out everything so that it is transparent, isn't it? Guys, there is uh, some five quadrants in which you have to check the corneal sensation. You you use that cotton whiff and check, right? You have to check up, down, left, right, even in the center of the cornea. That is the pupillary area, isn't it? Above the pupillary area, I think. Okay. Then coming to sclera, guys. We are moving to sclera. We'll go fast from here. Don't worry, guys. We are almost, uh, most of it we have done, right? We have to just look at sclera, right? You look at sclera, then you can uh, check the anterior chamber, the iris, the lens, right? Then if possible, you will check the fundus with something. Otherwise, no need. Then uh, intraocular pressure, they are telling. Anyways, you will, we will just look at sclera, anterior chamber, iris, pupil, yeah, and the lens. This much we will look at sclera. What will you see in sclera? The color of the sclera, right? So, if there is color uh, discoloration, it can be uh, some uh, uh, blue sclera, right? You can have blue sclera where it all in Bufthal moss. Then, uh, pathological myopia, did we see? Osteogenesis imperfecta, yes, very good. Then, coming to staphyloma, guys, if there is a protrusion of this uh, sclera lined by uveal tissue, it will be staphyloma, right? So, staphyloma can be there. Then, Sclera can be inflamed, inflamed, yes. Scleritis, episcleritis, very good. Then coming to anterior chamber depth. What is the normal depth of anterior chamber? 2.5 millimeter. 
So now let us say this anterior chamber okay, is shallow. Shallow anterior chamber you have. So when where will it be? In a small eyeball, yes, small eyeball. So that will be a hypermetropic eye, narrow angle glaucoma, intumescent cataract, phacomorphic glaucoma, malignant glaucoma, post operative shallow anterior chamber because of wound leak. Okay. Now let us say the anterior chamber is deep, it's a big anterior chamber. Then you'll have a keratoconus, keratoglobus, bufthalmos, myopia, aphakia. Okay. Irregular depth and depth anterior chamber, adherent leukoma and annular sinica leading to iris bombay. So there you'll have irregular depth. Iris bombay will have irregular depth, remember. How will you measure the anterior chamber depth, guys? Torchlight method, you'll just put light from the temporal side and you will see illumination on the nasal side. So basically, it will appear dark as it is not illuminated. Some uh, say, then you can say whether it is shallow or not. Okay, just to know whether it's shallow or not. There are other methods of uh, measuring the central anterior chamber depth. You have pachymetry, guys. Ultrasound also you can do. Ultrasound pachymetry, A scan they are saying. Okay. Then peripheral anterior chamber depth, can you measure? Slit lamp you need, they are saying. Okay. And you have that Van Herrig. Uh, slit lamp test you remember you need the slit lamp in that you have the van herrick test but you will check the two lines right how far they are the cornea and the other one is what anterior chambers see corneal thickness and posterior anterior chamber depth or something so you will see how close the lines are you can also measure the angle isn't it you need slit lamp for that so where are we did we finish anterior chamber or is there anything left in anterior chamber Oh, okay, we finished only the depth. We have to still look at the content. So, contents can be what? Hyphema, hypopion, then pseudo hypopion. You can have aqueous flare, aqueous cells, right? Where will you see aqueous flare? Uveitis. Where about aqueous cells? They will cause some Tyndall effect. Aqueous flare is because of protein particles, they are saying. And that aqueous flare is more marked in non granulomatous uveitis, okay? Then, there is some grading for that also. If you want, you can look at To know the angle, Angle, if you want to check, guys, uh, you have to do gonioscopy, isn't it? Guys, now let us look at iris, guys. Iris, let us look at uh, what and all. You have to look at the color, pattern and abnormalities. The color of the iris, guys, you will say if it is uh, heterochromia or uh, you will say that, right? So, if there is heterochromia, what will be there? There is something here called as the between the two eyes, there is difference in iris color or within the same eye, there is difference in color. And there are so many uh, things for that. If between two eyes it's different, then you can say uh, Horner syndrome, Fuchs, heterochromatic, iridocyclitis, iris atrophy, trauma, all that you can say, okay. Even in siderosis, bulby, malignant melanoma of the iris. So between two eyes it's different. But if within the same eye you have difference, then that is called as heterochromia iridis, okay. That this can happen because of uh, iris atrophy, right? The iris is getting atrophied, so it has difference within itself. Okay. What is the pattern of the iris, guys? So, pattern of the iris, you know, it will have this uh, crypts and ridges and collar it. So, whenever there is some atrophy and all, then it will, the pattern will get disturbed, isn't it? Then, abnormalities of iris, guys. Iridodonesis. Tremulous, that will be like tremulousness of the iris, isn't it? Because of aphakia and all, it can be there. Sinicae, sticking. Anterior, it will stick to cornea. Posteriorly, it will stick to lens. Then, there can be pseudo exfoliation. Then, that pupillary margin, you will see all the flakes, isn't it? Then, if you see pseudo exfoliation and all, what will you check for? You will have to check for glaucoma because these people can have raised intraocular pressure and affecting their optic nerve, etc. Then there could be a persistent pupillary membrane. Then what will happen? There's occlusion. Right? Rubiosis iridis, new vessels on the iris. Coloboma of iris, guys. Coloboma of iris can happen. Some tissue part will be missing, isn't it? It can be typical, atypical, complete, incomplete. Guys, in iris itself, we'll discuss of pupil, isn't it? Pupil is there only. So, uh, number of pupil, anyways, uh, that they don't like us saying. Anyways, site of the pupil, is it in the center, slightly nasal or something you can say? Then um, there is something here called as the size of the pupil. Normal will be 3 to 4 millimeter. This is midriatic, meiotic, small or big. Shape of the pupil, normally it will be round only, right? If it is uh, irregular, festoon pupil and all that you have, you know that, right? Oval shaped in uh, that uh, uh, acute congestive glaucoma. Then color of the pupil, guys. 
if it is jet black then it could be a fake yeah very good then normal pupil is black or grayish black okay then pupillary reactions you'll have to check direct light reflex and indirect light reflex near reflex also you'll have to check guys okay, so let's talk about the color of pupil a little more okay if the color is uh, no normal that is black or grayish black okay if it is grayish white it can be mean immature cataract if it is pearly white it can mean mature cataract if it is milky white as hyper mature cataract if it is jet black it can be a fake yeah if there is jet black with shining reflexes then it means pseudo fake yeah right if there is yellowish white mid dilated non reactive pupil that is amaurotic cat's eye pupil then you can see in retinoblastoma in uh, endophthalmitis very good then there is something here called as uh, retro lentil fibroplasia also you can see that kind of yellow reflex yellow you remember uh, actually yellow why you are seeing retinoblastoma it can white reflex is also retinoblastoma isn't it how will you check for near reflex guys you'll ask them to look far and then you'll bring your fingertip and ask them to look at that isn't it convergence so here you'll have to know the pathway of pupillary reflexes etc in near reflex they are mentioning two things convergence reflex and accommodation reflex okay then what else you should know here abnormalities of this uh, pupillary reflex you know you can have uh, marcus kun pupil then you can have uh, what else guys wernicke's hemi anopic pupil pupillary defects you have uh, ad stonic pupil argyle robertson pupil these two are f efferent pupillary defects okay then you have horner syndrome also efferent they are saying all this you should know guys then let's come to lens guys we have reached lens now so you know the position if it is not in the correct position it could be ectopia lentis what is this there could be trauma or some hypermature cataract right the nucleus will go down so, uh, so basically there can be subluxation or dislocation right now let's move on to the shape of the cornea see sorry shape of the lens in shape of lens what will you see guys how 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 is the shape of the lens you can see here now if there's abnormality in the shape it can be lenticonus or spheropachia cone shaped bulge is lenticonus looks like and uh, that will be like a cone lenticonus then you have spherophachia it's like a small spherical lens okay there are some names for these syndromes you can see then coming to transparency of the lens guys transparency of the lens uh, it, you will lose it where it cataract color So same as pupil, whatever you see in pupil, now that only comes in color, right? That's it. Then in lens, uh, I mean here they have some. Uh, they are talking about Purkinje images also. Here you can pupil, right? When you are checking, you can check Purkinje images. So if there is a fake, yeah, you will see only two images, isn't it? Anyways, fundus examination you will not do, isn't it? anyways then coming to intraocular pressure how will you check digital tonometry you can use or otherwise you have to use applanation uh, tonometer guys we have finished the ocular examination very good now we have to give the summary right after giving summary you will come up with differential diagnosis what could it be kind of thing let us see what the differentials can be see you can differentiate um, you know within the cataracts cortical nuclear whether it is uh, mature hypermature all that you can differentiate then if there is watering eye is it because of hyperlacrimation or because of obstruction all that you can see so if there is swelling of lacrimal sac the differential some of them can be a mucosal abscess cyst or a tumor if it is a pterygium case you have to differentiate for it from pingucula from a pseudo pterygium right from a papilloma uh, you'll have to differentiate it from so many things like that okay then you will give your uh, investigations further what you need to do fundus examination slit lab examination or a b scan whatever keratometry all that you want to do then treatment you will have to suggest usual treatments what and all will be there you know in ophthalmology artificial trees will tears will be like carboxy methyl cellulose nsaids like flur b profen antibiotics like ciprofloxacin moxifloxacin antiviral cycloplegic atropine mydriatics like tropicamide phenyl efferin this is where you need this right to do examination of the eyes right to do fundus examination also so tropicamide 0.8% phenyl efferin 5% remember this phenyl efferin mydriatic important okay so those are the uh, usual drugs that you give so what have we looked at in this video we looked at history taking proforma basically bio data presenting complaints uh, history of presenting illness ocular history past history family history personal socio economic i think that will come in the bio data itself then temperature pulse respiratory rate blood pressure ocular examination you will do in that head and facial symmetry and ocular posture then visual acuity you will check eyebrows eyelids lacrimal apparatus uh, eyeball 
conjunctiva. I think eyeball we may forget, right? Don't forget eyeball. <coughs> okay. Before going to conjunctiva, remember as a whole you have to check eyeball. Conjunctiva, cornea, sclera, anterior chamber, iris, pupil, lens, the, the fundus intraocular pressure. Anyways, that you won't do. <coughs> So then you will give the summary, differential diagnosis, provisional diagnosis, investigations and treatment. Okay. So uh, let's look at specific uh, case presentations later. Bye-bye.